that there is a better way. Can I have an amen? amen. So I want to know today, before we go further in this, are you open to considering God's way in the teachings of Scripture and what the Bible says regarding money? Because the Bible is an eternal book, maybe written thousands of years ago, but the principles are eternal. And so what we, we're going to do today is share five principles from God's word concerning finances and uh, want to teach you. But I've got to know before we get into this, before we start, that you're open. Are you open to considering God's way rather than maybe how you've been doing it? And this is not uh, finances according to, to Paul K. Park. I'm doing my very best today to share finances according to God's way and uh, to abandon our way. And are we willing to pray like David prayed? In Psalms, because we're talking about killing giants, and David was a giant killer, but David was not perfect. That's what I love about the uh, just how uh, scripture just throws it out there all the good and the bad. But he was a man after God's own heart. In fact, grab your message notes, and if you're ready, let's read this out loud together. It's from Psalm 23, 25, 4 and 5, and it's a prayer really that David prays, and he says, You know what? It's really a prayer that says, I reject the world's way, and God, I want your way. David was a man after God's own heart. Let's read it out loud together. If you're a newcomer to, to Harvest Family, sometimes we like to, like to do that and like to do that with great enthusiasm. So are you ready? Go. Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All day long, I put my hope in you. Aren't you thankful we don't have to put our hope in the American economy or the White House or the world economy, but our hope is in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Now as you turn over in your notes, you're going to see that we've got five biblical principles and if you need message notes, please raise your hand. If you didn't get a, a set of this, uh, uh, ushers, could you please help us? We've got some extra copies back there because I want you to get this. I want you to take great notes. Because I want to move quickly so we can get through this. But this is going to take you. I want you this week to process through this. Pray through this. And begin to allow your mind to renew. The, Paul says renew our mind. By the, trans, by the transform, of transformation that's in the life of the word of God. And so this week I want you to pro, pro, just process this. And pray through this. And, and uh, don't just gloss this over. Don't just put this in your Bible or leave it somewhere. And forget about it, but determine that you are really going to go God's way here. And so these principles are found all throughout God's word. And so when we ignore these principles, when we ignore any principle of God's word, then there, thereby we are saying, Lord, we don't want your blessing in this area of our life. But when we say, God, I submit myself to your truth in this area of my life, I want your blessing on my life. And to live without God's blessing in any area of your life is a huge problem. Amen? But to live, but think about, think about what it would mean to live with God's blessing on every area of your life. And even in this area of finances, what that would look like to be blessed by the Lord. Imagine to be able to conquer the giant of finances, living within your means, not going deeper in debt, not saying that there won't be problems. I'm not saying we won't be affected by the economy, but no more fear going to the mailbox because you're afraid of it. it's a debt collector. No more fear answering the phone because it's somebody that's uh, wanting to haggle you over a debt. And, and so no arguments with your spouse. Think about the blessing of the Lord. When we choose to follow God's plan, I'm here to tell you today, it is possible to do that. So if you want to do that, if you're ready, let's start very quickly. Number one, here we are. It's the principle of Accounting. Oh man, I can tell that went over great. Man, Pastor, can't we just sing how great is our God today? Accounting, and it means number one, keep good records. Keep good records. Every once in a while, you hear somebody say this about money. They say, ah, and I've said this. You don't have to raise your hand, but uh, I just don't know where it all goes. You ever said that? That's a huge warning, a huge red flag that we're not keeping 
good records. Have you ever heard someone say money talks? Have you ever heard that phrase, money talks? Well, that's not true. Money doesn't talk. It slips quietly away in the night while you're asleep and doesn't say goodbye. <laughs> Amen. Look what the Bible says, Proverbs 27. It says riches can disappear out. What? Out. Fast. Fast. Anybody want to stand and give a testimony to that? What do you need to do? Watch your business interests closely. And Proverbs actually says, remember, we're talking about an uh, eternal book written thousands of years ago, a different culture, different context. But it's, they, they were, it was an agricultural community. They owned land. They owned livestock. And Proverbs says, watch closely the state of your flocks and herds. Now, there might be somebody here with some goats and sheep. This is Texas. Hello. And if it is, we I, come on, let me know because I'm ready for a barbecue. <laughs> but how would that translate today? It would be more like know the state of your stocks, your bank account, your finances. So you got to know where you are. What's the condition? What are your assets? Where are you at? In fact, look at Proverbs 23, 23. Get the facts at any price. Turn to your neighbor and say, get the facts. Get the facts. Thank you for the two people that did that, by the way. So what facts do you need to get? Let me give you four really quickly. It's not in your notes. Just jot this down. First of all, get the facts of how much do I own. For some of us, that's very simple and very quick to do. How much do I own? What do you have? Possessions, net worth, in other words, and, and what we call it. Then number two, what do you own? What do you owe? What do you owe? What's my mortgage? What are my expenses? What do I owe my financial aid? Come on, college students. What are my debts? What are my liabilities? Then you need to know, what do you own? What do you owe? Then what do you earn? We know where it's, we know where it's gotta go, but what's coming in? How, how much money's coming into my life? How much do I own, owe, earn, and then how much do I spend? Oh, come on, somebody. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. And you can do this. Just take this inventory and do it. You can, if you're very OCD, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly, but, but just take the time and sit down and answer these questions. And somebody says, Pastor, I don't have time to do that. If we've got time to worry about finances and be stressed out and be worried and to be, have sleepless nights, then we've got, let me know, we've got time to practice the biblical principle of accounting and keeping good records. Amen. Woo, that'll make you want to shout. Amen? Amen? Number one, keep good records. Number two, the principle of budgeting. And that simply means that I plan my spending. In other words, I love this statement. I love this statement. I tell my money where it will go. I will not wonder where it went. I'm, in other words, I'm going to tell my money where it's going to go, and I'm not going to be sitting wondering where it went. Imagine that. that would be, wouldn't that be an awesome place to live. We all want to have enough, but we're not sure what enough is. In other words, you're going to have to put together a budget. What does it take for me to live? What does it take for my family? I know budget's a negative term. A lot of us don't like budget. Think of it in terms of goals. What are the goals there? Personally, think of it in terms of goals. How am I going to spend my money? What am I going to save my money for? What are my spending goals? What am I going to be spending on food? What am I going to be spending on Clothing. I'm trying to break it down the best I can. But there are spending goals. Then there are saving goals. Saving goals. What, what are you saving for? And I encourage you, if you're not even, you say, I can't afford to save. You can afford to save five bucks a week. And I encourage you to do anything you can do. You know why? Because it's going to get your mind thinking in that term. If you begin to do that and, and begin to practice that, that will begin to change. There are spending goals, saving goals. Then... There are giving goals. Here's what I'm going to give. And so it's better to set those goals, uh, set those goals and just think about, oh, man, a budget. And so however you think about it, you've got to be clear because you cannot live the rest of this year like you lived last year and the year before and how we did things before or we're going to be in a major crisis. Look at what the Bible says, Proverbs 21, 5. Let's read this out loud together. Are you ready? Plan carefully and you will have plenty. If you act too quickly, you will never have enough. Now this gives us first a double warning. Look at the part that says, if you act too quickly, you'll never have 
enough. In other words, we've got to plan our spending so we don't end up what? Get caught in the trap of impulse buying. And that's what gets us in trouble. We spend too quickly. We see something we want and get it rather than budget for it. God's not down on nice things. It's okay to have nice things. Uh, new shotgun, fishing pole guys. <laughs> Ladies, shoes, that new dress, whatever it is. Vacation, it's okay. Nice car, that's fine. As long as we plan for it, save for it, budget for it, prepare for it, then you're okay. Look at the, it says plan carefully and you will have plenty. And I want you to get this. If you don't get anything else out of this today, financial freedom, financial peace, financial security, slaying the giant of finances, if you will, however you, whatever you want to call it, it's, it's not based on what you earn. God actually says it's based on what you spend. It's not based on what you earn. It's based on what you spend. I know a lot of people who make a lot of money, but they're neck deep in net because they're spending more than they're making. Who's, more, who, who's better off, the person that makes a million and spends 1.1 or the person that makes 40 and spends 30,000? Are, are, you, are you hearing what I'm saying? Am I coming up the right street with this? If, and we, we hear it and we say, if I just made more, I would be better off. And it's okay to believe God for that and, and for that increase to come. And I believe that it will in your life. But here's what I've noticed. Many times as our income goes up, so does our outflow. Amen. Our expenses. And some of us, we're making more than we ever made than you were as a teenager or when you first started working, but sometimes we can be even more dead and we've got to get it under control. So freedom is not if I just make more, I would be financially free. No, no, you won't. Freedom is not making more. Freedom's not spending everything you make. Oh, come on, don't shout me down this morning. It's spending less than you make. It's the principle of budgeting. In fact, God says this is an IQ test. God says, I can tell how smart you are by how you spend our money. Look at Proverbs 21, 20. This is, man, God hammered me with this. God, God says, fools spend their money how? As fast as they get. How many ever heard that burns a hole in their pocket? Money just burning a hole in my pocket. Well, Proverbs doesn't advocate that. So how do we spell relief when it comes to this area? Budget, gold. So on the back of your notes, I want you to look on the very back at the box on the back side. And it says, my next step today is. You see that? Look at number three. It says, commit my financial life to God. I want you to prayerfully uh, think about checking that box. It's a very important step. that I'm going to commit my financial life, live by its principles of smart money management, like to learn what the Bible says. You can uh, uh, just to make that commitment to say, you know what? I recognize that I need God's help in this area. And I want to, to go deeper in this area. So the principle of accounting, keeping good records, principle of spending, plan my spending, or principle of, of budgeting. And then across the page, number three, save for my future. Save for my future. And that's, of course, the principle of saving. I know you're writing all this down and checking it on the back. The Bible is not down on saving. Okay? We say, oh, you don't need to save. You just need to trust God. When Deuteronomy, he actually told the Israelites, I will bring my blessing upon your storehouse. What is that? Savings. The blessing can't come upon something that's not there. Amen? So uh, God's not, and I hear people say, well, you're just being presumptuous. No, maybe God wants you to learn how to trust him by learning how to save. In fact, it's biblical to save. It's wise to save because Proverbs actually says, go to the ant. The creator God in, in nature, creation, shows his glory and shows his nature and character. And prop, the, the writer says, go to the end and look at, his, look at what's going on there. May, take a lesson from this ant who see, foresees a season ahead and he's preparing and he's saving and getting ready for winter. Look at Proverbs 21.20. It's the opposite, by the way, of this foolish person we just looked at. The wise man or woman saves... For, did y'all know that was in there? I mean, wow, isn't that amazing? Look, recently I read the average Japanese family saves 25% of what they make. 
That's pretty intense, isn't it? 25%, they put it in the bank. Average European family, 18%. An average American saves 5%. God bless the USA. I'm saying if you want to learn to save, move to Japan. No, I'm not saying that. Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, maybe a little easier, but this is a discipline God wants us all to learn. Look at Proverbs 13, 11. It says, money that comes, how? Easily. Disappears, how? Quickly. And that's God's verse to protect us. You ever been up late at night and you see all the infomercials? All the get-rich-quick schemes. And somebody says, man, if you'll do this and do that. And, and you think, man, I could do that. I could sell that. That might would work. And, and because when you're under pressure, why? when we're under pressure, we're doing what? We're looking for an easy out. But the Bible says, look to God. And it says, money that's gathered little by little will what? Isn't that amazing? It's so true. Albert Einstein said that compound interest is the most powerful force in the universe. Interest. Credit card companies know that. Charging 22% interest, that's just evil. Okay? Whether you start with saving $5, 50 500 five, five, whatever, get started. In your notes, I've got there a great resource for you to check out. It's a book by Dave Ramsey. How many of y'all heard of old Dave? He's a Christian, and Dave actually began to, to look at, I want to see what does the Bible have to say about financial principles. And it's a great book that's going to help you with the first three principles we talked about uh, today it's going to help you to learn how to save. And actually, the first thing that he says you need to do is give to God. And then the next thing you need to learn how to do is know, uh, learn how to save $1,000. And then go from there on down the line. It'll be a great resource to help you take this further than just get through this message today and, and move forward. Get on the right path. So keep good records. Principle of accounting. Plan my spending. Principle of budgeting. Save for my future. Principle of Number four, this is the keystone that ties it all together. The principle of what? Tithing. Tithing. Getting God on your side. Number four, return 10% to God. 10% of all that I make goes back to God. That's the principle of tithing. What I've discovered after 16 years of ministry that a lot of people are familiar with that term, but they really don't know what it means or there's been some really bad uh, teaching on it or unscriptural or manipulative teaching about it. And so... Uh, what some people say about it couldn't be farther from what, what the Bible actually says. So I want to real quickly tell, teach you exactly what the tithe is all about. And of course, I don't have time. You can get on our YouTube channel, go to our website, YouTube channel. Last year, how many of y'all remember we taught the series entitled The Blessed Life? And we talked about we give God our first and best and He will bless the rest. And it's more blessed to give than it is to Receive. But one of the most famous passages on this is Malachi 3, 10. The tithe starts before the law was ever given. Tithing is before the law. It was before the law. It came through the Old Testament. And then we see in the New Testament, Jesus validating the practice in a phrase that he makes to the Pharisees. But it says, bring to my house. God's talking about bring to my storehouse. In the Old Testament, on the Old Testament, that was the temple. In the New Testament, that's the church, specifically the local church where you attend, you're ministered to, you have a relationship with other believers, and you say, I am banding together with this local church, this body, to, to uh, further the kingdom of God. So God's saying, give to my church a full tenth of what you have earned. Now, the word there in the Hebrew is the first tenth. Big difference. Now, the tithe is not just any tenth. It's not like the last ten, because I mean, if we waited to give God the last ten, it wouldn't be there. The IRS has already figured that out. Hello. Amen. They got that from God. No, I'm just kidding. No, they didn't. But, uh, so we bring to the house, the storehouse, the church, the full tenth. And God says, this is amazing. God says, test me in this. How many know uh, Jesus said to Satan, you shall not tempt or test the Lord your God. But this is the only time in scripture that God has said, I want you to test me in this. I want to show you how awesome I am and how faithful I am and what I can do in your life. I am giving you and all it is is an invitation by God to invite him into this area of your life 
so you can enter into a place where God is Lord of your finances and the blessing and the hand of God is upon it and you can do more with 90% than you ever could with 100% without it. Can I have an amen? amen? And that's good preaching even if I'm doing it. God says, I want to prove myself financially to you. This is God's financial plan to further his kingdom in the, in the church. Did you realize statistics show that only across the board nationally in the church that 20, only 20% 20 of people actually tithe, return 10% to God? You know what that means? That the church is actually only functioning on one-fifth of its potential. Functioning only one-fifth of its potential on what we could do for the kingdom of God. Wow! Think about that. Man, so we're talking about the giant of finances. How do we slay this giant? Have you ever noticed that, giant, that the giant of finances comes in to rob you? It has robbed you in your past, possibly, if we've messed up and haven't known God's way. And it, it's robbing us of our future because we're so worried about it, we're stressed out about it, and we're living with the day-to-day -day struggles of not, not having enough. But then we're robbed of our future before we ever get there because uh, if we go down the same path, we can expect the same results. And so all this, uh, the giant of finances is messing up past, present, and future. And so how, have you realized, though, what's so awesome about this? Is that God's antidote is the tithe. God's antidote is the tithe. Because when you give the first 10% to God, you're, you're saying, God, you are the God of my past. And when I bring my tithe to you, it's a representation of what you have given me to help, strength, life, oxygen, breath, gift, talent, and ability to make. And I am bringing it unto you as worship unto you to say that you were the God last week or this last pay period in my life that has blessed me and allowed me to make this. So it's saying, God, you are the God of my past. And then it's saying, God, you are the God of my present. You are the God who says, I am that I am right now as I am giving, I am acknowledging you as God of everything in my life. And then it, it uh, does something to our future because it says, God, I'm giving this tithe unto you because your word says, if you'll, if you'll tithe, I will open the windows of heaven unto you. And so now I am in faith. As this act of faith goes forth, I am now in faith to know that I'm not worried about my future because I am now in a covenant with the living God who cannot lie, that has promised that my future will be blessed. Somebody shout amen. Yes. God's antidote. God's antidote. And so when we give that to God, and we're saying, God, you're the God of my past. You're the God of my present. You're the God of my future. Let me just give you this. This is a principle of first. We talked about this the first of the year when we talked about seek first. How many of you remember that? Yeah. Seek first. It's bigger than all the principles today. And just jot this down. It's not in your notes, but it's this. The principle of first says whatever area of, of your life that you want God to bless, put it first in that area. Whatever area in your life that you need God to bless, put him first. If you want God to bless your relationships, put him first in that dating relationship. Put him first in that marriage. If you want God to, to bless your career, bring that before him. And put him first in that area, in, the, in every single area. If we want God to bless our finances, put him first in our finances. How do we do that? The tithe. The tithe says, God, you are first. You are first. When you give your offering today, you're saying, God, you're first. Yes, I'm, I'm, God, I'm just not up here telling you something to do that I'm not doing myself. I've been a tither my entire life. And Brooke and I are living in the blessings of the Lord uh, because we're in a covenant with God. And so the tithe says, God, you're first. And, and uh, here's what I hear over and over and over, the testimonies of people that have not been tithers and I love you enough to tell you the truth, even though there's manipulation and there's excess. And even though in the body of Christ, a lot of people, they're from different backgrounds. And so there's a mindset that says a preacher should not even say anything about money. But I love you enough and care enough about you and want the blessing of God on your life enough that I'm willing to run the risk of offending somebody to have the blessing of God on your life. 
And here's what I hear over and over. When I've begun to give 10% to God, the blessings of the Lord be began on my life. There's been more financial stability and peace in my life than when I tried to live on 100% without saying God, you're first. Here's why. Would you rather live with God's blessing on 90% without the 10 or, or without God's blessing with 100%? That's the principle of tithing. So how do I tithe? Look, 1 Corinthians 16, 2. Paul says, on every Lord's day, on the first day of the week. And you know what that really says to me? Every Lord's day, every Lord's day, consistently, whether I'm there or not. And you know what's so awesome about this church? We have people that you're going out of town, you're not going to be here, and you're like, thank the Lord, here's a stamp, the church has a mailbox. Isn't that awesome? Because you're so conscientious of your commitment before God. And so Paul said, every Lord's Day, systematically, whenever I get paid, put something aside, what you've earned during the week. And guess what? Uh, if you didn't earn anything, then there's no time. Amen. If you did, you give the tithe to the Lord. The amount depends on how much the Lord has helped you to earn. Here's a promise of that. Proverbs 3, 9. One of the many promises. It says, honor the Lord. Let's say this out loud together. Honor the Lord by giving him the first part of all your income. Here's a promise. He will fill your barns to overflow. Somebody shout overflow. overflow. I already feel better just by saying that word. Amen. But sadly, the exact opposite of that's what's going on in our culture. We're in debt. We're going deeper in debt. If we want God's blessing, then we're going to have to return 10% to him. And I've got a challenge for you. I'm calling it. And we've done it before. But I'm going to do it again. It's called the six-month tithe challenge. And I want to challenge you over the next six months, six months, to say, Lord, I'm going to test you. You're not testing me. It has nothing to do with me. This is a covenant between you and the Lord. And you say, Lord, I'm not going to live my financial life apart from you anymore. And I want to challenge you to bring the full tithe to God. Not tipping God. That's what a lot of people do. Tip God. And if you get real good service, five. And if worship is really awesome, they give 20. Amen. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. But uh, I want to ask you, men. I want to ask the guys. Men, are you man enough to accept the six-month tithe challenge and lead your family spiritually and to leave your, leave your household as a spiritual leader. I want to ask you, are you man enough to accept the tithe challenge from the Lord and say, I'm going to lead my family forward in this regardless of what's going on. And uh, I want to challenge you to do that, to, to do that. Because God says, even if you're here today and you're not even a believer in the Lord, this principle works. Even if you're here today and you don't even believe in God, I guarantee you, you begin to do this. Things will begin to change and God will show up in your life in this area in a big way. And if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, why not tithe? It's an issue of obedience for one thing, but it's also an issue of blessing. I love my father-in-law says, it's really, uh, the people argue there's a curse, there's not a curse. It's Old Testament, it's New Testament, it's not. He said, guess what? I get the blessings of a tither and that's just an IQ test whether or not I do it. Amen. So I want to challenge you to do this because of what God's going to do in your life. And you know what? Six months from now, when we're past the summer, into the fall, you're going to say, Pastor, thank you so much for sharing that. And where I am now, six months from now, from where I was, because you were willing in, uh, to share the truth and care enough about me to do it. So men, are you man enough to take the tithe challenge? Bring the full tithe. How about it, ladies? Single moms, are you woman enough to do this, to say, I'm going to give God the tithe over the next six months. Here's what I want you to do. And I didn't make it a next step because I didn't want to make it easy on you. There's no box for this. If you say, Pastor, I'm willing to take the tithe challenge, then just on your notes right now, if you're willing to take the six-month tithe challenge, I understand you may need to talk to your spouse and pray together, but really the scripture is so clear, there's nothing to pray about. Amen. Nothing to pray about. It's pretty, pretty obvious, okay? But God says, do this, and then it's taken care of. But just write, tithe challenge. Just write, write out, tithe challenge. Write it out on your notes somewhere. If you're not willing to take it, but your neighbor is, just write their name on it. No, tithe. No, just... And here's why this is so important. Jesus said this, and I encourage you to memorize this verse this week. Luke 12, 34. And you may still be writing, tithe challenge. 
But for those of you that those of you that are man or woman enough to take the challenge, here's why: when you give God first place, it affects your heart. It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. Uh, that's really what it's all about. Jesus said this. Let's read this out loud together. Luke 12, 34. Are you ready? Let's start. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Here's something that I picked up from my spiritual mentor, my father-in-law. Did you know that your heart follows treasure? You say, just make a conscious decision and say, I'm going to place my treasure here. Then guess what? Your heart will follow. Treasure. Amen. If your treasure is uh, golfing, fishing, hunting, whatever, you know, if that's where your treasure is, guess what? Your heart's going to follow that. If your treasure's in the kingdom of God, that's where your heart is. So powerful. I want to encourage you to, to think deeply upon that verse this week. So here's the four principles, and this is the last one as we close. Uh, principle of accounting, budgeting, saving, tithing, and then one more. Back of your notes. Go ahead. And read it. It's called the principle of contentment. The principle of contentment. That simply means that I enjoy what I have. And you might write out, not what I don't have. It means I enjoy what I have. I enjoy what I have. It's a principle of contentment. And guess what? This principle is being violated all over the United States every day. And even in Houston, Texas. Because we've got this beautiful South Texas region. Beautiful sunrises, sunsets. We can go to Galveston, San Antonio. All this uh, blue bonnets. All the fun, awesome things to do. Go fishing. Whatever we want to do. And, and we're so busy because it's all about more, 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 more. This, and this cost of the desire for more, we get overextended financially. Go deeper in debt. And uh, really, more should be a four-letter word when it comes to our finances. Honestly, it should and we need, God says, I want you to break this pattern. I want you to break this pattern because of, because of the more overextending yourself. I'm not talking about the more that you've budgeted for and planned for and taken care of God first and, and you're uh, able to do. But this more that's deteriorating relationships, your relationship with other, others, and obviously your relationship with God has all kinds of consequences. The Bible gives some very strong language Concerning this in Ecclesiastes 6.9, it says it's better to be what? Satisfied with what you have than to always be wanting something else. Circle that word satisfied. Satisfied. Just reading that verse lowers my stress level. Amen. When, you go, when we do things God's way, guess what? Stress levels go down and faith goes up. Amen. And here's a truth. Here's a powerful truth. You don't have to keep up with the Joneses. I'm not talking about Brad and Reese. They're an awesome couple. And I uh, love y'all. <laughs> but uh, you know what I mean. And let me tell you something about that, uh, the, you know, that you're trying to keep up with. They're secretly in debt. They're secretly stressed out over their finances and eat up with stress. So why in the world would I want to try and keep up with them? Amen. I want to be satisfied with what I have. Look at what Hebrews 13, 5 says. Be what? Content with what you have. Turn to your neighbor, just kind of poke them in the arm, wake them up and say, be content with what you have. And then pat them on the back and say, love you. That's kind of what I do. I'll poke you in the arm. Love you. The Bible says that things will never, ever, ever satisfy. Do you know that? When you're looking for satisfaction in life, people think it's about things. That's the world's way. It's not. It's about people. It's about your relationships. It's about your family. It's not about the stuff. People, we think it's about uh, more. It's not. It's being content with where you are and what God has given you right now. It's not about just material blessings. It's about God's blessing, period. God's presence and peace in my life. And so wherever I trust for my happiness, whatever my security is in, guess what? That becomes my God. No wonder Psalm 49 challenges. Don't be dismayed at the wicked who grow rich. And this, in context, is talking about people that grow rich who abuse the system and all that. But watch this. Their homes become ever more splendid. But when they die, they carry nothing with them. And here's the truth. Neither will you. Neither with me. I'm not carrying any of it with me. My hearse will not have a trailer hitch on it. Amen. <laughs> 
It won't. And it can pile it in there in the grave. We pile it all in there with you. But you're not going to take it with you to the other side. And guess what? It's a journey we're all taking. And that's why Jesus said, invest in eternity. Because this life is short. And ultimately, uh, and, and look at this, the wealth will not follow them. Their wealth will not follow them where? Into the grave. You're an eternal being created for eternal purposes. And the Bible says ultimately financial pressure is a symptom. Financial pressure is just a symptom. The giant of finances, you know what, is really not the giant we're facing. But it's just a symptom. It's not. What's the real problem? And let me just say it this way. Out of control finances are a symptom of an out of control life. And if we are not willing to submit our finances to God, then we probably won't submit other areas of our life to God either. Mismanaged money is a symptom of possibly, I'm not saying always, but, a, but of a mismanaged life. I know there's hard times. I know there's calamities and things that happen. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But here's what I'm ultimately saying you and I need. We need a man life manager. We need someone who will manage our life and not just part of our life. We need somebody to lead us, somebody that we can follow. And let me tell you, his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. You can follow him in every area of your life. And so if you're here and you say, Jesus, I want you not just to be, and many of you here, you're a believer. And Jesus is the CEO, the chief executive officer of your life. But maybe he's not the CFO. Maybe he's not the chief financial officer of your life. Maybe this is an area that you've held back from God. Today is the day where you say, God, I freely reject my own way. Because here's the thing. Do I think that I'm wiser than God, the creator, on how to handle uh, this important area that he is? No, obviously I'm not. God is so much wiser. Which we Let's just bow our hearts today. Bow your heads. Bow our hearts today in uh, that last verse when we begin to operate according to these principles when we say God I'm willing to go your way I'm willing to keep good records plan my spending save take the tithe, six month tithe challenge and uh, what's the next six months just do it for six months see God says return 10% and then start practice the, practicing the principle of contentment and guess what? If you really want to need exercise, that, that, that verse, Ecclesiastes 6.9, print it out. Tape it on the back of your credit card. Be satisfied with what you have instead of always wanting something else. Take that verse. Cut it out. Just a real practical tip. Here's the thing about God's principles, though, friends. They, we just can't play around with them. Can't just play around with the Word of God. We have to commit. We have to say, God, I don't want this anymore. I'm tired of this. I'm not going to go that way anymore. I want to live by your principles. If you're here today and you've never become a Christian, you can give your life to Jesus Christ. And here's what you get if God's on your side. Last verse. I want you to meditate on it this week. Think about it. If God be for you, who can ever be against you? And God wants to set you free and set your mind free from stress, worry, pressure, and conquer this giant. And guess what? You know, this giant only looks big. From your perspective, did you know that there, from God's point of view, there's no giants? Because God's bigger than everything and anything. And so when we begin to live life from his perspective, hand it over to, hand it over to him and realize that the size of my God will determine the size of my giant. And when I realize that God is so much bigger than any giant I will ever face, his promises, God, you're for I don't care what is against me today. Let's bow our hearts and pray together. As we bow our heads, I want you to pray. I want to pray for specifically for those of you that are in financial difficulty, if you will, if you're here this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed, because really it's, it's, it's not even my business. It's your business and God's, but I just want to agree with you. But if you're here and you say, I just, uh, Pastor, I'd like for you to pray have special prayer for me. Nobody else looking around, just the Lord. See, you just put it up and put it down. Just put it up and put it down. You say, Pastor, I'd like, yes, I'd like prayer for my finances today. I'm not going to have you come forward. I'm not going to embarrass you. Yes, just uh, the Lord sees it. Yes, it's just an act of faith. Yes, and say, I'm responding to God. Anyone else, just I want you to pray for my finances today, for our finances today. 
I really uh, want and desire that in my life. The Lord sees, sees that. And if you just be, you can put it back down all the way across. Thank you for your courage. Father, you see these hands today. And I don't know their individual situation, but Father, you do. You love them. You care about them. You want to be on their side. And God, I know that there are many here today that are experiencing financial stress and difficulty and strain. And so, Father, as they begin to follow your principles, as they begin to live out your word, the situation, and invite you, Holy Spirit, into this situation and live it out, renew our minds to the truth of God's word, your word, the th these things are going to begin to change. And I just pray that you would miraculously turn around the finances. Lord, replace their debt with the light of Jesus Christ. Replace their pressure with your peace. Help them get a hold on their finances to stay on your pathway to financial freedom. God, I pray for a miracle of finances in the lives of those that really need it today. Everybody, just you can pray this in your heart, every single one of us. Father, I just want to follow your financial principles for the rest of this year. Lord, just forgive me for spending more than I make. Forgive me for the unwise purchases that I've made. We've all done it, God. Help us to get, get on track with your plan. Lord, today I just commit myself to your financial principles. With your help, I'm going to start keeping better records. I'm going to start putting you first in my finances by returning the tithe, the first tenth, back to you. God, I'm going to, I'm going to start enjoying what you've given me, what I have, and, what I, and not worry about what I don't have. Jesus, I invite you. Be my life manager. Just do that and say that to him in your heart. Lord, just be the, the chief financial officer of my life. And just turn it over. And, and mentally, all those bills and all those worries and all those cares. Jesus said, cast all your care on me because I care for you. Could you just mentally in your mind, I mean, it just helps me. I'm a visual person to just say, you know, here's these bills. Here's this mortgage payment. Here's this electrical bill. Here's this... Uh, hospital bill, here's this, whatever, this credit card, whatever it is, financial aid or college loan, Lord, I just give it to you. I'm tired of wrestling with it. I'm tired of losing sleep over it. And Lord, I just turn it over to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you'll truly do that in your heart, God's saying, I'm here to help you. I'm here to help you. I really feel that so strongly in my heart today. If you would make a conscious decision of your will, to do that right now. Many of you have never done that. Many of you have never done that. And it's going to give you so much freedom, so much peace. Thank you, Jesus. Just thank Him right where you are. Thank Him for His peace. Thank you for replacing stress, worry, depression, anxiety with peace and power and love. And those of you that are here, you never pray, Jesus, come into my life. If you pray, just pray that, Lord, come into my life. I want to follow you for the first time. For the first time, I repent of my sins from what I know to be wrong. I believe that what you did on the cross was for me. And by faith, through your grace, I just received a free gift of salvation. I turn away from my sins and I trust you, not only with my present, but with my future and my eternity, Lord. With my finances. It's in your name that I pray. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen and amen. Would you just praise the Lord? Put your hands together and just thank Him. incredible uh, leader, servant leaders in this church, and they have a, an awesome uh, daycare on uh, uh, Green, Greenhouse in West New York, and if you, if you need a daycare, I'm just, you know, but they do a phenomenal job, and uh, she has a proposal, is that right, that you need to submit this week and ask for prayer, and many of you other, maybe this week you're facing a major financial decision, and I thank her for her courage and transparency to step out in faith and say, you know what? Because you know what prayer is? It's prayer saying, God, I'm not big enough to handle this problem. And you know, many times God brings us through problems and tests and circumstances to say, are we going to try and type A through this? 
and go to plan B or are we going to submit it to God and say, God, here I am and I need your help. And I realize that I'm not going to be independent of you. I am dependent upon you. If you're here and, and uh, you just receive this prayer for yourself because I know that there's more than just her. Maybe this week, this week you're facing a major financial decision and we just want to invite the Lord into that. Can we do that? Do that just so they can bow our hearts, raise your hands, however you feel comfortable. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you for Brother Sterling. Brother Sterling, come on up here. And Sister Kendra, and I thank you for the blessing of the Lord that is upon their lives because they are generous givers and have been faithful in their finances. They are in a covenant with you, God, in their finances. And so, Lord, we just expect you to work a miracle. And, Lord, in many times it's going to be an unorthodox, it's going to be something totally uh, because you are such a God of creativity and variety. And so, Lord, we're not going to try and figure it out anymore, but we're just going to submit it to you. And so, Lord, we just come into agreement as the family of the Lord. And we're family. And so, Lord, as a family, there's strength and support in a family. And that's what they want. And so, Lord, as a family, we just bind together with them and agree with them that this financial situation is resolved. And, Lord, we're going to glorify. Your, there's going to be a testimony of your glory and your praise through this situation a visible demonstration of your power and your miracle working power, Lord, that you will be glorified and people will be brought to you to know that we serve a living, resurrected God who is very intimate and very involved in our lives. And we thank you for that and praise you in Jesus' name. And, and for everyone else, the major financial decisions being faced this week, we just bring it up to you, cast our care upon you because you care for us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Well, let's give the Lord a big hand. Give him a praise. Come on. Give Jesus a standing ovation. Man, he's awesome. Wow. Love you, Lord. Our ushers are coming. You may be seated. Before we dismiss, we're going to get to practice today what we've been talking about. And you know what? You can change and decide today to make a change and start this six-month pie challenge today. I encourage you as soon as you possibly can. But we're going to uh, give the Lord the first today and uh, start, these, start these principles. And uh, thank you so much for your giving. Thank you so much for your uh, commitment financially to this body. Because without your giving, without your consistent financial giving and choosing to put God first, Harvest Family would not be here. Would not be here at all. We don't have some grant. We don't have some scholarship or money coming in from some other church. I mean, it's a faith work. It's a faith work. And God is using you. There's no way a church plant like this should be in this four-acre facility that we owe about $350,000 on. It's probably about a $2.5 million worth property. There's no way that we should be in this building. It is God. Amen. It is God. And I thank you that you are the type of person that says, you know what? I am looking for to do something of kingdom significance. And you know what? You can be, and thank God for every church in this community. There are awesome, wonderful churches in this community. All the wonderful men of God in this area. And I'm talking like in a 10-mile radius right here. We have a, this is an awesome area. But you know what? I'm so thankful because it takes a special person to say, I don't need all the bells and whistles. I'm willing to pick up the towel like Jesus told me to do and volunteer and work and say, you know what? I'm not here because of what it is. I see what it's going to be. And I just, just give yourself a hand because of your faithfulness. Brooke, I love you so very much. And you are making a difference. You are making a significant impact on the kingdom of God together. Father, we just thank you for the privilege to worship you with our tithe, returning uh, returning the first 10% unto you. And we worship you. And Lord, this is your antidote. This is your antidote to defeat the giant of finances. Because Lord, today as we worship you, we say, this Lord is a representation of my past. That you were the God of my past and you allowed me. You gave us the strength and the ability to earn this. Lord, you're the God of my present. And in this act of faith, presently, I say, you are my God now. You are the God who supplies all of my need according to your 
riches and glory. And so, Lord, you are the God of our future because you promised as we are obedient in this act of faith today, we can expect your blessing in your hand in our future. And we give you praise for that. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said amen and amen. The Lord bless you as you worship him. Bless your people all day long, Father. And God's people said amen and amen. Praise God. Have a blessed day.